the United States will pursue a healthy economic relationship with China. We will seek to cooperate with China on global challenges, and we will deploy our economic tools when needed and in a narrowly targeted manner to protect our national security and that of our allies, as well as human rights. President Biden and I firmly reject the idea that the United States should decouple from China. This is my video update on this Saturday afternoon, April the 6th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with an embassy raid, an embassy raid that took place in Ecuador. Embassies are no longer safe. There was a time when embassies were considered to be safe, but not anymore. Because yesterday in Ecuador, Ecuadorian security forces attacked the Mexican embassy in the capital of Quito and arrested the country's former vice president, Jorge Glass, who was hiding there. At the same time, Mexican diplomats were injured. Although Ecuadorian Foreign Minister Roberto Canseco personally arrived at the scene and protested against the actions of the police, this did not help. Mexico immediately began the process of severing diplomatic relations with Ecuador. Mexican diplomats will leave Ecuador immediately. Meanwhile, the director of Latin America Watch, Augustine Antonelli, said that the Mexican government could declare war on Ecuador for invading the embassy and such a decision would not be hindered. Incredible, huh? Incredible. Julian Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy for how long? For seven years in London, huh? And yesterday in Ecuador, they raided the Mexican embassy. And diplomats were injured. Mexican diplomats were injured. So let's, uh, let's talk about the, the Israeli, the Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy in Syria. Let's revisit that story because we are getting reports from CNN, NBC News, CBS News, all of these collective West mainstream media outlets are reporting that the United States and Israel, they are bracing themselves for an Iranian retaliation to that embassy bombing missile strike in, uh, in Syria on the Iranian embassy. A senior official told CNN that the U.S. government believes retaliation by Iran is inevitable and added that the Israelis share this assessment. Officials warned that an attack could come as soon as next week. According to officials who spoke to NBC News and CBS News, American intel suggests that Iran could use a swarm of Shahid kamikaze drones and cruise missiles and that Tehran could target an Israeli diplomatic or consular facility. The potential attack was discussed during a phone call between Biden and Netanyahu on Thursday, CNN said. I don't think it's going to be that, that obvious of an attack. But what do I know? I'm not an intel official. I'm just taking uh, an educated guess. I don't think it's going to be a retaliation this soon. I don't think the retaliation will come this soon, but I could be wrong, and I don't think it'll be um, a retaliation on an Israeli diplomatic uh, mission using missiles and Shahid drones. I don't know. That doesn't sound... 
that doesn't sound like the type of retaliation that Iran will uh, will take up. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong, and uh, and either way, the U.S. and uh, Israeli intel they are uh, they are bracing for the Iranian retaliation. They see it as inevitable. Yeah, it is inevitable. That's that's true. So yesterday I reported on on the Blinken uh, NATO story, where Blinken was in Brussels for the NATO summit, and Blinken said that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. This monument marks the spot where Armenian refugees fleeing persecution during the genocide of 1915 first landed in Cyprus. In case you were wondering about this beautiful statue. So, uh, Blinken in Brussels saying Ukraine will become a NATO member, right? That's what Blinken said. In my report yesterday, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, it didn't look like Blinken was, was, uh, was too confident about that. His statement, his body language, it didn't seem too, too confident in his statement about Ukraine entering NATO. And, and sure enough, you got this story from the New York Times dropping yesterday with the title, NATO wants to show support for Ukraine, but only so much admitting Kiev is a non-starter as long as the war with Russia is raging. But the member nations want to show they are supporting Ukraine for the long haul. For the long haul, huh? As long as it takes. For the long haul. From as long as it takes to for the long haul. Interesting. Very interesting. So Ukraine will not be invited to NATO during the July summit in Washington. This is according to the New York Times, and they are citing NATO alliance officials. Officials in the U.S.-led bloc are worried that such a drastic move would draw it into the biggest land war in Europe since 1945, the New York Times said, adding that NATO is looking for a middle ground instead. When they say that NATO is looking for a middle ground, what they are saying is that the United States is trying to find a way to manage this conflict, to keep Ukraine fighting, to keep Ukraine believing that one day it will enter NATO for, uh, for at least the, the election uh, cycle, at least until November 2024. That is what they mean when they say that NATO is looking for a middle ground instead. How do we manage this conflict so that it's Ukraine that uh, that continues to fight Russia so that they can stay afloat at least until November 2024. That's the middle ground that they're looking for. How to prevent the collapse before the elections. How do you prevent that collapse? Because according to the New York, or according to the New York Times, Ukraine entering NATO just can't happen. First of all, it can't happen because the country's at, uh, at war. It's in a conflict. And uh, you can't enter NATO if your country is in a conflict or has territorial disputes, open territorial disputes. And then, of course, is the, the small little problem that if they were to ignore the, uh, the condition that you can't enter NATO if your country's in, in a conflict, if they're to ignore that and decide that they're going to let Ukraine into NATO, well... That would, be, uh, that would be Article 5 conflict right away, wouldn't it? That would mean that NATO right away would have to go into war with Russia, and that can't happen. The U.S. is not going to, to go to war with Russia, at least not during the election uh, cycle. And Europe, well, the European countries of NATO, they're not prepared to, uh, to fight Russia, that's for sure. But someone who who disagrees with my analysis, who says that perhaps European countries can fight, uh, fight Russia in Ukraine, 
is none other, without the United States, is none other than a historian and military analyst, and I believe uh, a, a neocon light uh, guy. His name is Edward Lutvak, and he wrote an article for the publication Unheard with the title, It's Time to Send NATO Troops to Ukraine After 75 Years. The alliance is locked in the nuclear age. So, Mr. Edward Lutvak, in this article for Unheard, is uh, saying that Ukraine will lose. So he admits in this article, he states that Ukraine will lose. It has lost this war. And that the only way to possibly, to possibly save uh, Ukraine, to prevent the collapse, is if European NATO troops enter the conflict, go to Ukraine, and he floats out the idea, the plan, which I believe Macron was the first one to, to publicly float this out, but uh, he floats out the plan of uh, sending European NATO troops and UK uh, NATO troops into Ukraine, and they could, uh, they could relieve Ukrainian troops who are located away from the front lines. They could, uh, they could man the borders with Belarus. They could do other uh, auxiliary uh, functions and operations and tasks, and that would free up uh, Ukraine uh, soldiers to go to the front line and to be annihilated by the Russian military. But that, that would uh, keep the NATO troops away from the front line, according to... Uh, to Lutvak, and, uh, and that would mean that, that we would avoid um, uh, a Russia-NATO smash because the troops would be far away in, in the rear, in West Ukraine. They would be doing non-combatant functions, and it would free up the Ukraine military to go to the front line and try to stabilize the situation and to perhaps uh, prevent a Russian victory. That is the thinking from... Edward Lutvak. And he says in the article that if, uh, if European NATO troops do not enter Ukraine, the conflict is without a doubt lost. Of course, Dmitry Medvedev, he said yesterday that any NATO soldiers that enter Ukraine, whether they go to the front lines or whether they are manning the borders with Belarus or performing other operations, even non-combatant operations, if they are NATO soldiers, they will be seen as the enemy, they will be annihilated, and big rewards would be paid out to the Russian soldiers that annihilated those Ukraine, those uh, NATO soldiers. That is what Medvedev said just yesterday. The arithmetic of this is inescapable. NATO countries will soon have to send soldiers to Ukraine or else accept catastrophic defeat, military strategist Edward Lutvak wrote in an op-ed published on Thursday by the British online media outlet Unheard. The British and French, along with the Nordic countries, are already quietly preparing to send troops, both small elite units and logistics and support personnel who can remain far from the front, who can remain far from the front. Medvedev, he doesn't see it like that. He does not see it like that at all. Once you cross the border into Ukraine and you are a NATO soldier, according to Medvedev, you are fair game. So that's, uh, that's the article from this military strategist for Unheard. Not the first time we've, we've heard this plan. We've heard this plan before. Uh, most notably, Macron was talking about this, sending, tw sending 20,000 French troops to Ukraine, and those 20,000 French troops would not be on the front lines. But uh, I think the Russians have been crystal clear as to what's going to happen to the NATO troops that enter Ukraine. Either way, the statement from Blinken just yesterday about Ukraine entering NATO, it's already being walked back. It's already being walked back. So what, uh, 
What can the Collective West do? What can they do in order to to control the the narrative? To prevent to prevent the information, the fact that Russia is winning this conflict and that Russia has won this conflict. How do they control the narrative and control the the information, the headlines in and around this war? Because they have been telling us for two years now that Russia has been losing. Russia is using shovels. Russia is using chips and dishwashers. Russia is running out of, of everything, really. Running out of weapons, running out of men running out of missiles, running out of bullets, running out of rubles. What does the collective West do? Well, they can, they can start to, to cope. <laughs> to cope is what they can start to do. And they can start to, to explain away the two years of misinformation. They, they have a way of rationalizing, of explaining uh, the two years of misinformation as not being misinformation at all. You see, the collective West, what they're going to tell us now is that the two years where we have been reporting that Putin has had 30 heart attacks and the Russian military, they are fighting Ukraine with shovels. That was not misinformation. Actually, that was fact based, honest reporting because all of a sudden it seems like all of a sudden russia the russian military they've gotten help from china and it was the chinese who stepped in and saved the butts of the russian military which was right on the brink of collapse like it was right there about to collapse and then china came in and uh and they saved them they saved the russian military and uh, not only did China save the Russian military, but, uh, you know, Russia, they suffered huge losses, massive losses during the two years of fighting. But the information now is that Putin somehow, some way, he managed to mobilize more troops and the Russian military has, has been made whole again. So... If you see the Russians uh, starting to, to win this conflict, just keep in mind that the Russian military was at one point in time suffering from, uh, from terrible losses, but Putin somehow managed to reconstitute the military. So Financial Times is reporting that Anthony Blinken, he warns allies of deepening Chinese support for Russia. And the Financial Times is reporting that... The U.S. Secretary of State is saying Beijing's, Beijing's assistance to Moscow's military industrial complex is at a concerning scale. Basically, this article from the Financial Times is saying that China came in and China provided factories, the manufacturing, the technology, the washing machine uh, chips, to, uh, to help Russia uh, build up its military, build up its weapons uh, supplies, its weapons inventories, and uh, to, to change the tide of the conflict, really. To change the tide of the conflict and to start winning the war. It was all because of China. Nothing to do with Russia. Nothing to do with Russia at all. China came in and saved the day. That is what the Financial Times is basically reporting. And then you have the person that took over for Victoria Nuland, the Under Secretary of State, Mr. Kirk Campbell. He said that, and I quote, we have assessed that Russia has almost completely reconstituted its military. Its newfound capabilities pose a longer term challenge to stability in Europe and threatens NATO allies. Quite an admission from the Undersecretary of State, Kirk Campbell, the guy that took over for 
the temporary Undersecretary of State, Tory Newland. He is saying that uh, that Russia, you know, somehow, some way, they managed to reconstitute their military. So don't be surprised, everybody, in the collective West. Don't be surprised if you see a big, powerful Russian military start to, uh, to really win this conflict. Do not be shocked. Do not be surprised because somehow over the last couple of months, Putin managed to rebuild the military, of course, always with uh, China's help. So the two years where, uh, where the Collective West were reporting about uh, Russia's, Russia's inevitable defeat and Ukraine's victory, well, this can now all be explained. It was China. It was China and it was uh, the mobilization conscription efforts of, uh, of Russia to reconstitute its military. That's, that's how the Russian victory is going to be explained. Yep. And, uh, you know, the EU, the EU, as they prepare for a catastrophic defeat at the hands of Russia, they need to continue to demonize Russia because one day this conflict will end. Sooner or later, this conflict will end. And the European Union, the leaders in Brussels, they're going to have to continue to, to keep their citizens afraid, scared of the Putin boogeyman, because for the European Union, they need to keep the citizens scared so they can centralize more power into Brussels, get to, uh, get to the point where they can issue war bonds, euro bonds, and then get to, to an EU army and uh, direct taxation. So they're going to have to make sure that Whatever happens from now until the next, until the end of the year, which, uh, which could see a Russian offensive and, and a Russian victory in Ukraine, the European Union is going to have to make sure that EU citizens remain afraid of the big bad Russian monster. And so we have some more Russian demonization attempts being uh, being created, including this one from the Czech Republic, which is saying that Russia is trying to sabotage European railways. Yep, it is the Russians that are trying to sabotage European railways. According to the Financial Times, get this. Get this uh, Twitter post from the Financial Times. Russian attempts to destabilize European energy infrastructure have been well documented, but thousands of interferences in transport networks have been less discussed. The Czech Republic has warned Russia is trying to sabotage European railways. <laughs> wow. Wow. Russian attempts to destabilize European energy infrastructure have been well documented. To disrupt European energy infrastructure, Russia disrupt European energy infrastructure, energy infrastructure, pipelines, gas pipelines. Gas pipelines going to Germany? Gas pipelines going to Germany being blown up? Is that what, is that what the Financial Times is talking about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like, like a type of disruption to, to Europe's energy infrastructure. And we know that Russia didn't, didn't blow up that pipeline going to Germany. That was Gilligan. That was Gilligan and Marianne and Ginger <laughs> on the Andromeda yacht, rented from, from a Polish uh, company, right? <laughs> under, the, under the supervision of one-time General Zelushny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. 
do, do these people hear themselves? Do they read the, the posts and the stories that they are writing? Do, do they read these things and maybe take a, take a step back and say, uh, maybe you shouldn't put that line about Russian attempts to destabilize European energy infrastructure in this article. <laughs> oh, boy. But, you know, articles like this, they kind of worry me. Because when they say that Russia is trying to also disrupt European uh, railway systems, I don't know, that worries me. That makes me think that they could be planning some sort of, uh, of sabotage or false, false flag, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, he was asked about this, uh, this latest claim of, uh, of Russian, Russian meddling, Russian sabotage of Europe. And Peskov... He said, he was also asked, by the way, about uh, Macron's statement that Russia is trying to sabotage the Paris Olympics. And Peskov said, and I quote, these are absolutely unfounded accusations in both the first and the second cases. They are often heard, but they are never supported by any adequate evidence or argumentation. We absolutely do not accept such accusations. That was the reply from Peskov. They never do provide any evidence, do they? And when the evidence points the other way, at some, some collective West uh, involvement, well, then they just shut down the investigations, like, like Germany and Sweden shutting down the uh, Nord Stream investigations. The publication Public, they have an article with the title, Government-Funded NGOs linked to NATO are interfering in European elections. And this is an article from Michael Schellenberger. And in this article, he talks about how NGOs in Europe are, are protecting establishment candidates while smearing opposition as Putin stooges. <laughs> that is what the NGOs in Europe are doing. And this is, of course, meddling in elections. This is election interference. And that is what this article is talking about. Here is a post from Michael Schellenberger. Russia bribed politicians, EU officials claimed, but they provided no proof and made no arrests. And now public has learned NGOs are working as front groups for Western military and intelligence agencies to spread disinformation and interfere illegally in European elections. If you want to have a, a sovereign country, a healthy sovereign country, one of the first things you have to do is expel all the NGOs. <laughs> that is like the first step. Get rid of the NGOs because they are always up to, up to no good. An interesting uh, article from uh, Schellenberger on the publication called Public. And uh, I have no reason to doubt his reporting. NGOs contracted by intel agencies and military agencies protect the establishment and smear the opposition by branding the opposition as Kremlin stooges. Makes sense to me. Anyway, let's, uh, let's do some, uh, some clown worlds, huh? And we'll wrap this video up. And, uh, and the first clown world is uh, P. Diddy did not kill himself. <laughs> That's the clown world. P. Diddy did not kill himself. Sean Diddy Combs, his former bodyguard, claims music mogul had tapes of politicians and princes. He had every room bugged. A lot of information coming out about Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, and, and all the Epstein-esque, Epstein-like things that he was doing. And the reports are that, well, according to his bodyguard, 
the information is that P. Diddy, he had all the rooms bugged and he has all the, all the tapes and all of the recordings of what was going on in his, in his many mansions. Anyway, that is, that is the first clown world. And the second clown world is actually a Twitter post that Secretary of State Blinken put up on the 29th of March, but uh, I'm getting to it now. And the post from Blinken says, throughout Women's History Month, we've been celebrating the extraordinary legacy of trailblazing women who have built, shaped, and improved our nation. Today, I'm thinking about the women who have served as Secretary of State and all they've done to advance U.S. foreign policy. And all they have done to advance U.S. foreign policy. So let me put on the screen as I walk to the beach. Let me put on the screen the image that Blinken attached to this Twitter post with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And all they have done to advance U.S. foreign policy. All right, everybody, that is the video, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop. Look for some limited edition merch. The link is in the description box down below. Take care.